Hello, everyone. If you look around the world, you can see that everyone is and everything is in turmoil. Unfortunately, there is a full blown war going on in the Middle East, exactly on the day of the solar eclipse. Uh, unfortunately, so everyone who said that this is not a mild solar eclipse was right. Uh, and of course, the, we don't know yet what is going to happen, but it's really horrible that people again don't know how to reserve, how to resolve their uh, differences, how to resolve their problems, and they are adamant of exterminating each other. Having said that, we can actually look at the sky again. Two days after the eclipse, uh, the Sun uh, Austria conjunction becomes exact to the minute and second. So let's take a look at this particular chart. Uh, and uh, this gives me occasion to look at Australia as the karma breaker and destiny changer in karmic astrology. First of all, this is the London chart. As you can see, uh, it uh, it has a, a an Aquarius rising uh, in the London chart, which is quite rare because Aquarius, Pisces and, and Aries are fast risers so you you actually very rarely get those uh, in, in in charts and Pluto uh, which retrograded back into Capricorn uh, uh, maybe two three weeks ago is on the ascendant so transformation is necessary the Pallas Athena Lilith conjunction is in the 10th house of rising to, towards the mid heaven and uh, Pallas Athena is the wise girl and Lilith is the first turning point in the Lilith myth when Lilith says, I don't want to be below you, uh, representing revolt against injustice. Here's the Sun uh, Austria exact conjunction. Interestingly enough, the vertex, which is the, the point of no free will, is on trans Pluto, the dimension jump. And uh, so it means that uh, it's very, it will be very difficult to com come out of this mess that we are in, actually. Uh, this is what you see everywhere, by the way. And uh, on the IC, well, actually the IC is hugged uh, between uh, Uranus, or by Uranus and the chart ruler and Sedna creation through dissection, uh, which is not yet a conjunction, uh, actually, because Sedna is in Gemini. It won't go back to Taurus and it's going to take another half a year, a couple of months before Uranus actually moves into uh, into um, uh, Gemini. The uh, year 2025 is really, really a biggie. A lot of things are going to change. Almost all the, the major planets are, are changing uh, signs. Well, actually, Jupiter does it every year, so that doesn't count too much. But but uh, uh, Pluto moves back into uh, Aquarius for good. Uh, and uh, Uranus will go into um, Gemini and uh, Pisces will move into Aries and that, so they, uh, will Saturn. So it's going to be a major shift. But at the moment, you have this uh, this soul energy. Lots of things are at the very last uh, degrees of the, the signs. Uh, and there's a limbo energy there. So, uh, and of course, tension is boiling. That's what you see. So here you have the, uh, uh, it's interesting that both karma breaking uh, archetypes are very prominent. Aries, uh, which is drastically altered outward circumstances. It's separating from, from Chiron because Chiron, of course, is a bit faster than Aries, uh, but uh, it, they will be again conjunct next year. So that's again uh, a very difficult aspect uh, from a karmic viewpoint. Aries denotes the outside karma breaker. What does it mean? Let's say you are in a marriage, you work for a company, you have been there within this marriage or for this company for the last 20 years. Everything is okay, not too um, not too um, exciting, but at least quite reliable. Nothing is really happening. You don't do really too much. Um, uh, you, you do love your husband or this is what you think. You do like your work or at least this is what you think. And, but it's, it's really a dull existence. And then something from the outside world pushes you out of your equilibrium and you are all of a sudden in a totally, totally different position. So that's Aries, the outward karma breaker. And if you look around, we, uh, according to the powers that be, we Europeans and Americans, so the Western world, we uh, became too posh, too rich, 
to um to um uh, meek let's put it this way and of course too bold at the same time so it's it's high time we uh were shaken up that's what they are doing uh it's funny the the, the picture that comes to my mind now that i'm talking about this is that if you put different types of ants into a, a jar and until you actually uh, shake the jar, nothing happens. You shake the jar and all of a sudden uh, they start fighting. That's what we are, we are being shaken in a jar. That's what's happening to us. Uh, they want us to be, again, totally com compliant uh, with their uh, goals. So that's, that's, the, um, that's the chart. And let's take a look at Astrea, the star maiden. She is the inner karma breaker. She is very different from Aries because Aries stirs uh, things in the outside world. And uh, things that you might not even want to do, but are forced to do because the, the things change around you. Whereas Astrea, uh, if you look at her myth, uh, the name, of course, means the star maiden. And she is Zeus, one of Zeus's daughters. Zeus has a number of children uh, from various god goddesses and, uh, and uh, mortal women. I don't remember who exactly the uh, mother of Astrea is, but it doesn't really matter because... You have various versions of the myth. And Astrea, she's a very pure and simple girl. And she doesn't know what to do up on Mount Olympus because she's not like the other goddesses and gods. She doesn't want to uh, have this very meager and futile existence that they are leading. So she asks permission to move down to the earth plane to the people. And actually, Zeus gives her permission, so she... She appears uh, uh, among them and she does everything that the, the, the people do. So she takes part in their everyday chores and, and she leads a very meaningful life. But then comes the problem, uh, according to Hesiodos, uh, Hesiod, uh, the historian, there were uh, five ages of humankind, uh, the golden age, which ends with uh, the um, reign of Kronos, Zeus is uh, the Silver Age, then comes the Bronze Age, then comes the so-called um, Heroic Age, which is a little bit better. That's an up upscale in the things, because at least we have heroes that are setting an example to everyday people. And then comes the Iron Age, which we are there at the moment. And the, during the Iron Age, people get very savage and horrible, and so the gods leave them for good and never actually appear among the people except for Astrea who is still there but then comes a, a point in time when she too gets very much fed up with, with people so she goes back to the Mount Olympus where she um, doesn't again feel too good about what's happening there because she's totally bored and and she doesn't want to to have this futile existence so she asks her father to put her up on uh, into the heaven and she becomes Virgo, this constellation Virgo, who holds the scales, the, the scales of truth or, or justice in her hands. And that is why very often those who don't do comic astrology uh, somehow mix up Astrea with ju uh, justice, justitia. Uh, but they are two different figures completely. Because actually, when you look at the history of the asteroid uh, Astrea, she is the fifth of the asteroids and up till she was discovered, uh, they thought that these the first four, the, the first big four, are ma minor feminine planets. But then Astrea, when it was spotted, uh, they realized that it's too, too tiny to be, to, to be named even dwarf planet or something like that. So she effectively changed the destiny, uh, the course of how we look at these new types of celestial objects, the asteroid. And uh, so that is a, a destiny changer for sure. And for us in the in the natal chart, Australia uh, does the same. Wherever it is, it denotes that this is where you need to change your destiny. You need to break old embedded karma. That's her function. And it's very important to understand that this is not jumping out of karmic act uh, uh, actions or not jumping out of karmic situations. You stay there until you think that you can resolve it. And you do everything in your power to try to resolve it. But then comes a moment when you realize that it's futile completely. And that is when you can break out of it and change the course of your destiny. Because that's what Astrea's myth is teaching us. 
Okay, um, let's take a look at what we have in the London chart. I did include Saturn, although it is a little bit wide for my taste, but it is retrograde. So actually it will close the uh, configuration. If what you have here is there is a little engine. There's also a harmony triangle and a rose thorn. And these are uh, put together in one. And I did include Mercury, although it is completely out of orb. Uh, but with Saturn, it does make a quincunx. So I figured I, I'm leaving it there. So let's take a look uh, at what we have. There's a little engine uh, involving a, a square, a quincunx, and a sextile. The, the true engine is a trine, so it's a much bigger uh, um, configuration. But even a little engine has the drive. Uh, you have a uh, actually, you have a sextile, which is dissolving the tension of the square. This is a cardinal square, so it gives you the necessary drive. And the, the quincunx is, actually it's a triple quincunx, uh, gives you the karmic intent of the whole thing. So that's what it is. The harmony triangle is made up by Saturn, Venus, and Ceres. The Venus-Saturn triangle will be uh, exact by tomorrow, uh, actually. So it's going to be completely exact, almost almost the same day, really. And the apex of the harmony triangle is Ceres, the nurturing principle. And of course, Venus, Saturn is always about uh, your self-worth, how you how you like yourself. Uh, negative aspects like stress and oppositions uh, were called by Judy Hall, my master, inherent unlovableness. But even the trine gives you this edge of, do, do I really, am I really lovable? Do people love me for what I really am? And then of course with the trine, you need to learn to love yourself. And the rose thorn, which is made up by two karmic aspects, quincunx and semi-sextile, uh, joined by a trine, is the, this, it gives you this karmic edge like, I'm sure I love roses. I I have a couple of ones in my garden. They always bite me, always. Whenever I go, I go near them, I get a thorn into my hands and, and uh, all kinds of scratches. I love them, but they are really vicious little uh, uh, plants. So that's a rose thorn, okay? The trine is really pushed uh, into place with, uh, with the karmic intent. So that's what you have. Okay, and uh, the transcendental celestial objects are quite uh, revealing again. On Ceres, you have Electra, which is, has been there for, for ages. Two asteroids are usually traveling together for actually four weeks. And this is what you see with Ceres and Electra. On Venus, you have Eos and uh, Urania, so uh, the, the, the dawn and the sky. And on this full fold conjunction, you still have the same things that two days ago were there. Attila, the fighter, the hero, the, uh, the king, uh, Hestia, the, uh, the uh, uh, priestess of uh, giving you ceremonies uh, and focus ceremonies. Horem have, which describes the potential to rise uh, uh, to impossible heights. Uh, Horem have was a slave who became an, a general and then became a pharaoh, all by himself, all by his own abilities and capacities. And Memnosune is the uh, muse of remembrance, that we, what we need to remember. There are three TNOs, actually one centaur, Raphonos, and two uh, TNOs, but in comic astrology, we use centaur for everything that is past Neptune, really. Just like when you see personal planets, and you include the sun and the moon, which are luminaries. Same generalization. So Make Make uh, is a TNO, which describes how you can bring back your soul, your broken soul entities. Your iPhone describes a uh, complete transformation for a the sake of a sacred duty. And Logos means creation through words. And then there's a fixed star, uh, the matrix still there. A di a diadem is no longer with an orb because uh, it's a little bit behind and the sun and everything has moved already uh, two degrees, uh, one and a half degrees. When the matrix is still there uh, with, with uh, the black moon, Lilith, and it's Epsilon Virgo. It's the, the fruit picking hand of the uh, celestial virgin. And okay, I, I think I've said everything there already because I started with Ceres. And the Queen de Chile is still very prominent. Queen of Chile is 165 degrees and denotes obsession and ambition. And uh, this is what you have here. Uh, two Queen of Chile, actually a pair, a number of Queen of Chiles, but 
you uh, don't have the semi-sextile closing it, so it doesn't become a quintile arrow. It would be interesting to 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 uh, see that, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the orb is too wide for a semi-sextile because that has the tightest orb, it's only one and a half degrees. Okay, and this is what you have uh, here. The um, Neptune Sun uh, Quintile is funny because all Neptune Sun aspects about are about clairvoyance how you see things uh, in, in a clairvoyant way. And if it's a square or an opposition, then you are striving towards it, but you don't really accept it. When the, uh, there's a trial or a conjunction, it's there by itself. You don't even think about it. And with the Queen de Chile, you question it and you want to, you want it, but question it and are obsessed about it. And it gives you the drive, the ambitious drive to understand its true nature. And uh, Neptune Astrea is... Again, the drive is there to look at things from the be be uh, from above and see the big pictures, to see through the fog and do the karma breaking process. And there's another one uh, between the black moon, which is slightly behind the sun and Astrea, and uh, Aries, the, the outside karma breaker. So actually, uh, they all get together. They all uh, uh, have this very potent and very focused drive of breaking old embedded karma, if possible. <laughs> I don't know how, really. I can't give you uh, good advice about this. But the fact remains that uh, what you see in the Middle East is 3,000 years old. Are they going to resolve it? Is Israel going to stay as a state there, or is it going to be drowned uh, and uh, exterminated? I have no idea. All I know is that the rage and and the um, the full and engined and 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 fabricated rage there is really uh, uh, consuming everything, unfortunately. And my heart goes out for the people there on either side. I'm never taking sides because I don't think that war is an answer to anything. Although I would gladly fight for my own nation if someone would attack it. That's the funny part. So I understand the human side of it. I just don't understand how anyone could think that this is going to be resolved in this particular way. I don't know. Happy October and thank you for listening. Bye-bye.